It is now time for member statements. I recognize the member from Toronto St. Paul. Morning, Speaker. On any given night, over 10,000 people in Toronto are experiencing homelessness, with over 50 per cent being chronically homeless for over six months. Many are hungry, battling mental health and addictions. Speaker, it's getting cold out there, and in our community of Toronto St. Paul's, we are worried because the effects of food insecurity and housing instability only gets worse in the cold winter months, and our overnight out-of-the-cold programs have been on hold due to the pandemic. I'm deeply thankful to the Holy Blossom Temple Out of the Cold program team in my community. They're running a hot meal pickup program from November 18th to April 7th of next year, between 4 and 5 p.m. On certain weeks, there will also be toiletries and warm clothing items given out too. I ask anyone who may need this support or who knows someone who needs it to reach out to Holy Blossom Temple or to my office and we will connect you. There's no stigma or shame in needing help. There are also other local St. Paul's community-based programs, such as our friends at Witchwood Open Door, run at St. Matthew's United Church, which I've volunteered at, St. Michael and All Angels Church Beat and Covered, which I've also supported, and the Churches on the Hill Food Bank, sponsored by Calvin Presbyterian Church, Christ Church Dare Park, Dare Park United Church, Grace Church on the Hill, our Lady of Perpetual Help Church, St. John's Evangel Evangelical L Lutheran Latvian Church, Timothy Eaton Memorial Church, and York Minister Park Baptist Church. The generosity in our community is overwhelming, Speaker, but community generosity should never and can never replace government responsibility. The issue of food and housing insecurity will not go away by itself. It requires political will. If not now, when? Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. I recognize the member from Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. Thanks for the opportunity to rise and speak about another friend of mine from the Peterborough area. When I started to write this statement, I thought, how do I describe him? Humble, caring, intelligent, committed. And then it dawned on me. I can sum it all up with this phrase. Joe is an exceptional human being. Speaker, I'm talking about my friend Joe Vancouverden, and some of you might be saying that name sounds familiar. And yes, you're right. Joe is the father of four-time Olympic kayak medalist Adam Vancouverden, and I have forgiven Joe for letting his son grow up to be a liberal. So why is Joe an exceptional human being? Joe has Parkinson's disease, and yet he consistently gives back to our community without ever having to be asked. He's part of a research project with Trent University looking into the effects that active lifestyle has on people with Parkinson. Fitness forums, boxing, dancing, walking are all activities that Joe takes part in for the active living research. I mentioned walking in particular because of the Parkinson's super walk. Joe's goal last year was $10,000 and an astonishing 1 million steps. For those of you with Fitbits, you know that your goal is 10,000 steps a day. So let's put that into perspective. That would be 100 consecutive days of hitting your Fitbit goal. If you want to learn more about Joe and his journey with Parkinson's, you can find more at www.joewithpd.com. Thank you. Member Statements, I recognize the member from Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. As we mark the beginning of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, I want to thank the staff and volunteers who work tirelessly every day to end gender-based violence in Waterloo Region and across Ontario. It is my privilege as the Member of Provincial Parliament to recognize the ongoing work of local women leaders in KW, including Elizabeth Clark at the YWCA, Sarah Castleman at the Sexual Assault Su Support Centre of Waterloo, and Jen Hutton at Women's Crisis Services, and of course Zonta KW. In the callous absence of leadership and adequate funding by this government, these women have stepped up to fight for supportive housing, anti-human trafficking resources, and they stretch their budgets to support women who have been raped and whose innocence has been stolen. When survivors have the courage to come forward and ask for help, the resources should be there to help them. When the Ford government cut the funding back in 2019, they turned their backs on survivors. Funding and resources available to agencies during this vital work remains insufficient, especially when the substantial impact of the pandemic. We have a shadow pandemic where violence happens in the dark and survivors are barely holding on. At SAS, 
counseling requests have gone up by 55 percent. For family court support calls, 158 percent. Staff are burnt out. My colleague MPP Lindo and I will not rest until we see women supported through the court system, through supportive housing and counseling, until women in Ontario no longer have to live in fear. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Residents in Scarborough Rouge Park are always looking out for each other. I saw this firsthand, especially during the peak of the pandemic, as the community came together to give back and look out for their neighbors and take care of our seniors. The Toronto Police Services is always giving back to the local community, whether it be through the food drives to, the, to support local community, local organizations, or picnics to foster the community spirit. Today, I rise to speak about the Toronto Police Services to, together to put smiles on children this holiday season. 41, 42, and 43 divisions are coming together to host their annual auxiliary Christmas toy drive. Toys will be distributed to families within Scarborough who reside in shelters or have been identified as having a need. The TPS toy drive is accepting new and unwrapped toys. Toys can be dropped off at both 42 and 43 division or can be purchased online and mailed directly to 42 and 43 divisions. And toy will be accepted up until December 14th at 12 p.m. The spirit of the season is all about giving back. I encourage you to do your part in giving back to your local community, to those who are most in need. I want to thank again all the police, the three police divisions, 41, 42, and 43, for serving and protecting our residents. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to say that I once again table legislation to have OHIP cover the cost of PSA testing in the province of Ontario. This year, it's estimated that 1,500 men will die of prostate cancer in Ontario. Yet we know that if diagnosed early enough, there is almost a 100% chance of survival for those who have prostate cancer. If allowed to get to stage four, this cancer only has a 25% survivor rate. Residents in Ontario can get an early warning of this disease by having a PSA level test early. But they must pay out of the, the test out of their pocket unless they've been already diagnosed with prostate cancer or ordered by a doctor. So why then is this life-saving PSA test not covered by OHIP? My good friend Larry Gibson of the Fort Erie Golf Course hosts a tournament every year to raise money to cover the cost of these tests for those who need. Gibby himself is a person whose life was saved when he paid out of his pocket for a PSA test, which showed his levels far above normal. Had you forgone this cost, he wouldn't have been diagnosed until the situation was much worse. Do you know that one in nine men will get prostate cancer in their lifetime? PSA testing is already covered in provincial health programs, eight provinces and three territories. My motion would save lives, save money, keep people out of the hospital. I hope the government will join me, support this motion, and get it, get it done for Ontario. And it's also important, we can all grow mustaches like mine, but if we don't pay for the test, men are going to die in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements? Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize a very special occasion for a very special person in the great riding of Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. On November 5th, cherished and dedicated veteran Mr. Charlie Fisher of Owen Sound celebrated his 107th birthday. I am truly honoured to know him, and I had a chance to visit Mr. Fisher on his birthday. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that it was a very special day for Mr. Fisher and his entire family. Mr. Speaker, he was teaching his eight-year-old neighbour to sketch and gifted me one of his sketches, which I will cherish always. Can you imagine when that young person reaches our age? and reflects on the fact that this special person had taught her to sketch almost 100 years older than her. 
Mr. Speaker, it was terrific to see the entire community recognize Mr. Fisher's birthday and strive to make it a very memorable day for him. Students from Owen Sound District Secondary School, family and neighbors, joined together to sing happy birthday to Mr. Fisher and also present him with 250 birthday cards from local students. Mr. Ryan McManaman's grade 12 history class at Owen Sound District Secondary School started the birthday card effort and it soon spread to other classes throughout the school. Mr. Fisher is a de decorated veteran of the Second World War and on his birthday, the Billy Bishop Museum brought over his Kodak bullet camera, his medals and his leather jacket from his military service, all of which are on loan to the museum and I encourage everyone to go see. Mr. Fisher enlisted in the military in Owen Sound and joined the 5th Armored Division, RCAC, SC in Aldershot. He was a driver with the Transport Corps and brought food, supplies, and materials to our troops. He participated in the defense of Britain, the Italy campaign, and in France, Holland, and Germany. During his service, Mr. Fisher took hundreds of pictures, and some of those photographs can be seen in displays at the Billy Bishop Museum in Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, I've never seen anyone more positive than Charlie Fisher. He bought a tablet at the age of 105 with a full warranty. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate Mr. Fisher for a tremendous milestone and thank him for his many years of service in defense of our great nation and for all that he has contributed to our community. He is a true hero, an inspiration, and in his words, never quit. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, today is the International Day for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, and the purple scarf that I'm wearing that all the members of the House are wearing is a symbol of the courage it takes women to leave their abuser. During the month of November, we wear our purple scarves to show people identifying as women and their children that the community supports them, that they're not alone, Speaker. It's especially important that we do this as men, because every year in Ontario, 20 to 30 women are murdered by their current or previous male partner. When we include other family members and men known to women, that number rises significantly. It's the number two reason for calls to emergency police services, Speaker. Because it takes the, uh, the support of an entire community and violence against women, I'd like to acknowledge a few of the agencies within my riding who are assisting women experiencing emotional, physical, sexual, financial, or spiritual abuse. YWCA Sudbury, Rezo Access Network, Sudbury and Area Victim Services, Sudbury Counseling Centre, Santa Victoria Profem, Sudbury and District Health Unit, Victim Witness Assistance Program, the Voice for Women Sudbury Sexual Assault Centre, and Speaker, I want to highlight Sudbury Women's Centre. I'm just proud to brag it was a place that my mom loved to volunteer when they were founded more than 40 years ago. As a member of Provincial Parliament for the riding of Sudbury, I want survivors to know they're not alone. I see you, I stand with you, and with all survivors across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, Member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Gun violence is both a public health and a social issue that leaves long-term impacts on our communities, and we must do more to break cycles of violence and support communities to heal. Exposure to gun violence has mental and physical impacts that extend far beyond the victim. It results in long-term effects on communities and marked by feelings of fear, anxiety, and hopelessness, and without access to long-term supports can lead to generational trauma. Just last week in my riding, our community grieved the tragic death of a young man just 23 years old. Unfortunately, these occurrences are far too often. This month alone, Toronto Police Services 43 Division responded to seven shootings and 32 so far this year. Gun violence is a serious problem and a crisis that cannot be ignored. It's an issue we see in more marginalized communities, rooting from underlying systemic inequalities in our communities. It's a problem that my private member's bill, the Safe and Healthy Communities Act, would bridge. It would declare gun violence a public health issue. It allows for counselling services for survivors of gun violence that will be covered by OHIP and for all boards of health to develop programs and services aimed to reduce gun violence and assist those affected. I will table this legislation next week. We have an opportunity to hear to, it, here to intervene before that bullet is trafficked or pointed at our neighbours. We can solve this root issue. I will call on the Minister of Health and the government to do the same and to support this legislation. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Speaker. Today, I rise to express my gratitude to the Minister of Health for her commitment to addressing the inequities in how small and medium-sized hospitals are funded in Ontario. 
I've spoken many times about the challenges faced by medium-sized hospitals like those in Perry Sound, Muskoka. Under the previous governments, these governments were chronically underfunded and had to ask the ministry each year for top-up funding to make it through to the end of the fiscal year. This made it very difficult for these hospitals to plan for the future in the same ways as larger urban hospitals. But Ontarians who live in smaller communities deserve equal access to hospital services. Increasing the base funding to our hospitals means that they can plan for future initiatives, stabilize operations, and budget more effectively. After the additional funding was announced this summer, Natalie Bubella, CEO of Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare, told me that for the first time in more than a decade, her hospital was predicting a balanced budget for the next five years. This is great news. It means Natalie and her team spend their time planning for the future rather than writing requests for additional funding and planning on what to do if those requests aren't approved. On behalf of Muskoka Gonquin Healthcare and West Perry Sound Health Centre, and on behalf of everyone who relies upon these great hospitals, thank you to the Minister of Health for addressing this long-standing issue. That concludes our member statements for this morning.